we're going to be talking about simply nicely asking to get hashes from Windows. Uh, given that we have over 600 people, I'm nervous as heck. See, I used the safe word. I didn't use the other word. So uh, forgive me if we stumble across through this. I think we will, and that is natural. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead. Jake. Right on. Um, so I hack stuff and I know things. I'm a senior pen tester for Blue Bastion. Um, I used to be Unix and Linux admin. That's where I kept my teeth in the industry. Um, uh, Kasim, being my boss, oftentimes when we are pen testing, will invoke me as malware, especially with his density for playing with PowerShell. So I've been invoked on many pen tests as malware. Um, my background was really in infrastructure and network and systems administration. So I tend to go into the weird stuff when testing. And that's part of what brought about this class that we're going to be teaching at uh, Wild Bus Hacking Fest, where we ended up spending a lot of time looking at misconfigurations or bad system admin habits. How do we know about those? One, because we see them on pen tests, and two, hi, I was a sysadmin. I know, I've seen me do it. So uh, yeah, there's nothing quite like finding the thing that you uh, you did wrong back in your past and then exploiting that to totally own a network and then just go hang your head in sadness. Kasim. Thank you, thank you. So I am Kasim. Uh, you can just say awesome, but I care before that. There's your cheat sheet. I am the director of offensive security here at Blue Bastion, a small consulting firm. Uh, Jake and I uh, work together here. I used to be in healthcare field quite a bit. So if you find me at DEF CON, I may have some stickers for you uh, that are healthcare centric and pretty fun. I used to also be a HIPAA high trust assessor. We used to play the role of CISO. So I've seen things from both the other side and from attacker side, and I, I can often complain about quite a bit of that. I do a lot of teaching. We are, Jake and I are teaching the class, as mentioned, at Wild West Hacking Fest. We've also taught similar classes at many of the conferences besides Black Hat. And then some of you here, I'm recognizing some names from my OCP bootcamp too. Okay, so let's uh, turn it over to Jake for some agenda talk before we get into the meat of it or for, uh, those of us vegetarians, the tofu of it. That is so wrong, especially with this group, considering the amount of tomahawk steaks that some people will consume this. Um, <laughs> all right, so we're gonna talk about what are net NTLM hashes, how they fit into AD as part of authentication, um, different ways that we can get those hashes, and then what we can do with them, relaying and cracking, and then talk a little bit about the defense side. We're big on dealing with this, that we want to attack, but we also want to talk about defense because being able to, well, I, I was once was told that the best pen test in the world, you can own up on somebody, but if you don't show them how to fix it and you don't give them a good report, it was useless. So it's a rule to live by as a pen tester. It's all about the report at the end and making sure that the client is able to change things and make a positive change based on what we do. Thank Go you. for it. Now, I also hear the word NTLM. So I do want to say whatever, but there's something I also want to clarify. Different documentation from Microsoft mentions it differently. There's a, a lot of sort of confusion that's created by it. The standard I'm seeing mostly in the security industry, net NTLM is mentioned when we are using over the network authentication. You're logging onto a network share. You are communicating with another computer. You're, we are talking about net NTLM. NTLM is for local authentication. So the hashes you'll pull from your SAM on the local box, that's where you'll get NT and LM hashes used for NTLM. Those are the ones you can pass. Net NTLM hashes you cannot pass. So we'll get into a bit of a detail uh, with that. Um, 
All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. First of all, you are a user or a workstation, a laptop, you want to access a file share. And as you want to access a file share, the file share doesn't know you. You have not been authenticated to the file share. So you simply say, hey, can we talk? You will see throughout the uh, slides, we're trying to use the language that works for everybody. I'm not really going too deep into the technical weeds of it on purpose. Really, the focus is, is to understand uh, at a high level what these things are. So the negotiate message, the first message the user is sending to the file share is, we need to communicate. I want to talk to you. Maybe I want to share some files with you. Maybe I want to download some files with you. As mentioned, the file share does not really know you. So it is going to say, let's first authenticate. Here's a challenge for you to solve. And that challenge oftentimes is just a random string. I've also seen some mentions of timestamps there that you have to, the user, encrypt with your password hash, NT hash, LM hash, and send it back to the file share. Okay. So I want to talk to the file share. The file share says, let's authenticate. And the authentication is solve this challenge for me. Encrypt this string with your password hash. You send that password hash encrypted string back to the file share. This is the net NTLM hash right here. Okay. This part is where we come in and we can snag that. So this three-part negotiation. I want to talk. Great. Solve this challenge. Here's the challenge solved. And that challenge being solved is a random string being encrypted with your password hash. Problem is, in the AD environments, I guess I don't want to call it a problem because it's a good thing. The file share does not really have my hash. It doesn't know what my password is. It doesn't know what Jake's password is. So it does not know if your solution of that challenge, your encryption of that random string with your password hash really corresponds to your actual password. So what file share is going to do in AD environments, it is going to send that challenge over to the domain controller. The domain controller ideally should be the only entity that has your NT hashes and your LM hashes. The domain controller tries to reproduce that challenge solution on its end. And if it is valid, if it finds that is accurate, it goes ahead and lets the file share know, yep, that was accurate. Uh, it is Cosm, it is Jake, it is whichever user we were trying to authenticate as. So go ahead and start talking. So that's where the negotiation begins. This overall is the net NTLM protocol. It's a challenge response protocol still exists in Windows environments and it will exist probably throughout our lifetimes. Um, and there are different versions of it. There are some issues with it. We'll talk about some of those throughout this. And as far as the versions go, there are two, V1 and V2. There are a lot of other different details one may want. At a high level, what we need to know is the V1 protocol, the older net and TLM protocol, is going to use LM hashes also. So it supports LM hashes. It is going to use DES for encryption uh, and challenge response computation. V2 does NT hashes. So the hash cracking speeds for V2 are a bit slower than V1, and still it's a pretty strong speed. Um, I believe on our work laptops, we've been doing it at about 5 billion guesses per second, something like that. It uses MD5HMAC, uh, similar to your NT hash. So can a similar attack be accomplished without a user? We'll get to that. And hey, Nathan. This is the typical format of NetRTL and V2 hash. I'm only talking about that because not really seeing V1 much. The most important thing to note is the username first. So you begin with a username, which in this case is FileMaker. Then you have the domain which in this case is training. So training slash FileMaker. Then you have the challenge. The uh, challenge that was sent over by the servers was 16 bytes, uh, sorry, eight bytes challenge in here that was solved by the client. Here's the response. And then the client's challenge in there. 
overall when you when it comes to cracking this hash throwing it in John or hashcat you take this whole thing and throw it in there okay when you want to obfuscate it for reporting you probably want to do the client's response and net and NTLMV to client challenge those are the portions you want to obfuscate in your reports uh, unless you want to also not talk about the users when I do talk about net NTLM hashes and I obtain them by using elicitation by using uh, broadcast multicast protocol poisoning we'll talk about in a minute I generally don't obfuscate usernames and I specify to the client that this is not user's fault a lot of the net NTLM hash being sent across the environment in Windows networks is a system configuration okay and you'll see that as a pattern throughout this talk there's maybe one or two demos I'll show that will have some social engineering involved for the most part this is a feature it's not really a vulnerability um in in sort of Microsoft's ways okay it's not a user's uh bad doing now when it comes to bad passwords if we were able to crack this hash quickly yeah then then you know good passwords are needed All right, let's go to the next slide. And how do we get these hashes? Fun stuff in here. First of all, you all may remember when it comes to a lot of the certifications, tutorials, and college, we are told when it comes to the name resolution, when I want to know where a certain host is, where a certain share is, I ask the domain name server. The DNS server is the only one I ask, hey, do you know where this is? That is not true, especially in Windows networks. In Windows networks, we are going to, one, send over a request to the DNS server, but also by default on Windows 10, Windows 11, and older versions, we're going to ask everyone in the network, do you know where this host is? Do you know where this file share is? These requests happen in parallel. I used to think they were separate requests. One, if, if you don't get the response to, from DNS, then we go to broadcast, but that's not true. It is parallel request. Everybody gets to know about this. And you can disable these. The broadcast protocol here would be NetBIOS name service, NBNS. That will, you will disable at the adapter level. The network adapter level is where you'll have to disable that. The multicast is where it gets funny. If you are using the GPO, I believe it is Windows administrative templates, network, DNS, and there it tells you turn off multicast name resolution protocol you are not disabling all of multicast by using that gpo that is only disabling llmnr and jake i'm going to screw that up it's local link layer multicast link, in there. link local uh yeah link local layer multicast protocol yay yes or, so yeah. llmnr <laughs> so you're only disabling llmnr if you're using that group policy okay what you need to do next is disable MDNS, multi-guest domain name system server, something. Um, and that is a registry setting. You can also do that via PowerShell. Windows 10 sends a lot of MDNS requests. Your Macs send a lot of DNS requests, okay? So in what we need to think about is in the name resolution scenarios, we have a lot of requests being sent across the environment to everybody in the network saying, hey, do you know where a certain host may be? So I'm going to pull up Wireshark. I am in a shared workspace environment. So let me show you what my Wireshark looks like right now. There we go. Let me filter on MDNS, LLMNR, and NBNS. Set a display filter. 
look at all of this MDNS uh, traffic in here. That is the most common one you'll see, especially when it comes to your IoT and your Mac. There are some very common wpad.local requests being sent. That is our favorite one. I have yet to come across organizations that use WPAD, but every time you'll pull Internet Explorer, Edge, Microsoft Windows is going to ask, hey, does anybody know where WPAD is so I can proxy my traffic through? We're going to respond and say, hey, we are the one you're looking for. You've got some HomeKit in here, Google Cast, there's some Google TVs in here, uh, a lot of uh, people's names with iPhones and MacBooks. I may not be seeing LLMNR and NBNS. That is more Windows-centric traffic. But if I stay here long enough, I will probably end up seeing that. Okay. But this MDNS traffic, especially when it comes from WPAD, that is a Windows box. I can respond to that. Okay. So at this point, then, we are receiving these requests. We respond to them. Say, I am the share. I am the device, the name you are looking for. This is a broadcast or multicast request. So generally, the first one to respond is going to win. Result of that is that net NT element authentication we were talking about, the challenge response protocol, will get the net NT element hash by responding to it. Okay. And this is one of the uh, previous uh, screenshots I took from the same environment, so a WPAD in here, you see some MacBook Pro sending NBNS requests. You have laptops sending NBNS requests. The best thing you can do in a pen test is listen. Uh, I don't know if Kali still has that tagline, but the uh, bat track used to. The quieter you are, the more you're able to hear. Yes. Yep. Just sit there and listen because you'll hear so much about the environment, you will learn so much about the environment, or you can prank people. There's, uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm in a shared workspace, so sometimes I'll walk out and I'll say somebody's name, just yell at it and, and just keep walking because I saw their name in the MDNS request because it's something like, you know, Cossum's MacBook. Uh, so fun stuff there, right? So this is, Really just pull up Wireshark, pull up TCP dump. Uh, there are some really cool tools for this too. Uh, what was the one that Southern's built? The uh, Jake? Uh, uh, Probellico. Probellico, yes. That's Probellico. I, I can't remember if it's working on the new version. There used to be a version that required Python 2 that was pretty awesome. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to remember the other one that we've been using. Tcreds, yeah. That one's yeah, Pcreds are pretty good. Well. Because you'll sometimes hear a lot of <laughs> passwords here too. Uh, a client of ours was using PDQ Deploy, really good tool. The, the objective of the tool is you are uh, talking to everybody in the network. And whenever you see a new device, you want to log on to it and make sure it's configured to company standards. It's really an inventory and configuration management tool. Problem is the way they had it set up was it wouldn't really do many checks on that device. It would just attempt to log on and make sure it's securely configured. So, Jake, I believe it was you running an NTLM Relax overnight or somebody else was running it, and it just talked to us. It just sent over that, uh, that uh, NetNTLM hash because it saw our Kali box as a new device, and because PDQ Deploy was set up as local admin everywhere for it to do configuration management, right away had DA just by listening. I uh, I remember hearing and seeing a coworker at a previous consultancy that uh, he was doing responder inside AWS, which normally you'd never get anything from it. But their, uh, their Palo Alto reached out. Is either Palo Alto or, uh, or Nessus, one of the two reached out, tried to authenticate against him, and he was able to crack the hash and it turned into a DA. And it was just one of those situations where listening for the response, prompting for it, got the information and game over. Yeah, yeah. One of the questions I'm seeing in here, uh, the any issues with disabling broadcast multicast protocols outright? Yes, some issues. 
I'm of the opinion that there should only be one authority to resolving names to IP addresses, and that should be DNS. If you start with that and you start seeing issues, you will have issues with likely with printers, with devices that just do not have access to DNS, maybe port 53 is blocked. Uh, you will see some issues with some other IoT devices that want to use MDNS to look for devices on the network. Uh, what I have ended up doing with some clients who need to use those devices, cannot use DNS for some reason, put them on a separate subnet, in a separate VLAN, uh, maybe in a complete separate physically segmented network. Because there should only be one authority in the network that responds to names. Otherwise, you'll have Jake and I sitting in there, and that's never really a good idea. So this right here is the, uh, sorry, just step back in here. The question is, uh, NTLM v2 response only plus requiring 128-bit encryption mitigate the issues in here. We'll talk about relaying in a minute where we don't even have to crack the passwords. So, you know, even with your 128-bit encryption, we'll have some fun with that. This right here is responder. On the left, the user is looking for a share that doesn't exist. As I mentioned earlier, maybe even it does exist. You still will run into similar issues. On the right, we have responder running, R-E-S-P-O-N-D-E-R, -E uh, by default installed in Kali. The responder is listening for any name resolution in the environment. First, we see MDNS request coming from the same box, LLMNR, MDNS again. So Windows isn't just doing one type of broadcast multicast, it's trying everything possible. And, and Linux and Mac people, uh, don't giggle because your devices do something similar too. So uh, we just go after Windows because you'll have more Windows in enterprise environments. Similar things do happen in Mac and uh, Linux environments. So what you see on the right is once we respond to that request, when we say poisoned answer to it, that means we responded and said, we are the EHR share you're looking for. Right here is where you see then, starting this line where it says SMB, the net NTLM authentication occur. The user is vagrant. The domain here is parent workstation. And then we have the whole hash. So everything starting from this vagrant right here all the way to these zeros is what you will throw in Hashcat to crack this hash. Uh, that is your broadcast multicast name resolution poisoning. Very common, some of the very first things we do, we used to laugh about this three, five years ago, and it still exists and it still works very well. Uh, there are some really interesting things about it. If you cannot disable it, you could do a honeypot account that just sends out these requests and watch and listen who responds to them. We have been burnt in the past by this and uh, we're very proud of that client. There's also some uh, endpoint protection systems that will automatically do that. They send out, the thing is that they're relatively easy to identify if you actually pay attention and learn how to wield your tools. You can configure yeah. it to ignore those and then only respond to the things that actually look like real Real users. So there is a dash uppercase A option responder, which is analyze only. That's what Jake's talking about. You simply listen to all the requests. You are not responding. And then a responder.conf file, you can specify what you will respond to. Okay, so you could do some tweaks like that to get around it. And what you've done now on the client's end, on the defender's end, is you've made pen, pen tester's life a little bit more difficult. And you've made the low-hanging food grabbing attacker a little easier to capture. Second piece to this, another way to capture credentials. This is authentication coercion, simply asking nicely. Okay, Previous one, we were listening and responding. We were using our listening skills. Here, we are asking very nicely, can you talk to us? There was petite portum vulnerability that came out, I believe it was 2021. It was using a Windows API to coerce a response, coerce an authentication, really not even authentication, communication from the domain controller. Some of you may even remember some of the old printer vulnerabilities, uh, print RPN vulnerability, where you could do the same thing. Simply ask the server, think of as MS 
uh, RPRN. It's been around for about a decade. Simply ask the Windows server, let's have some communication, let's talk without authentication. And in that sense, you still get net NTLM hashes. We are using Petit Podem quite regularly. Uh, problem we are running into, or clients are running into, and if somebody has a good solution to this, I don't believe there is a total patch to Petit Podem. You can still do it using authenticated credentials. So you tried Petit Podem exploit, or you tried Coercer, C-O-E-R-C-E-R, and it didn't work. Try it with domain credentials, any domain user's credentials, because that at that point is a feature. Because with an authenticated credential, you do have the right to talk to other devices. Then you may not have authorization, but the authentication can occur. Okay. So if you do petite podium and you don't get anything back, try credentials, and you may actually get some good success there. This is hey. the ask nicely part. Awesome. You mind if I toss in a couple of things here? Go ahead. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, so the the petite podium one went with the encrypted file system, specifically these remote procedure calls, where it's really talking to the domain controller and telling the domain controller to connect back. But this the coercer tool that uh, was talked about, we also posted a link to the actual tool in the Discord. And I think I it also went into the chat here for the webinar. That tool was a really awesome project where somebody took this entire class of these sorts of ask the domain controller to connect to me and you're going to get a connection from this computer account. And they took this entire class of connections and provided as as a service and logged each of them and just allows you to iterate through. So something may work and so you can scan with it. Um, a lot of the times in currently patched systems, yes, you're not going to get a connection uh, unless you have a basic set of creds. But if you can get one set of creds, that is the number one thing that the very first step to making a Windows domain fall over is I need a set of creds. Once I can get a set of creds, I can enumerate everything. I can talk to the domain controller. I can tell the domain controller to talk to me and we're going to get somewhere with it. So always an important thing. But yeah, the coerce tool is amazing. And uh, once you have a domain or domain credential, oh boy, now we're going to have fun. Back yep. to you, Justin. Thank you. So let's do a quick demonstration of Petit Bodem. Uh, I'm not going to go to the next step of Petit Bodem. We'll talk about how to use the hashes later. For now, what I want to do is simply obtain hashes using Petit Bodem. Okay. And let me share my terminal. You are, are able to see terminal. Uh, Jake, is it looking clear? Can yep, looks good. Excellent. Uh, I think it was under webcast folder. Okay. So actually, let me go to Petit Bottom folder. Petit Bottom tool is one of the coercion methods. Many other coercion methods, Petit Bottom is probably one of the more reliable ones I've been able to use. We have a domain controller in the environment. Let me take a look at that real quick. The domain controller is at 5.2. It is a domain controller with the name of domain as we are. And the domain name itself is training.rt.bluebashing.net. We also have valid credentials. So let's try FileMaker with a password of football. We just validated that the domain credentials are valid. So FileMaker with this plus sign on the left uh, tells you this is a valid credential. If I try Petit Bottom on its own, and actually before I try Petit Bottom, let me go ahead and uh, run Responder. So Responder dash I, I'm going to use the Tunnel Zero interface. That's where the network connectivity is for this lab. And I'm simply going to listen for the traffic with dash A. Uh, yeah, spelled Responder yeah, wrong, of course. And I need to be a case. Yeah, told y'all I'm going to be very nervous and uh, <laughs> there will be mistakes made. So we are listening on our tunnel zero interface. We're simply listening. We are not poisoning. If I try petite podium, 
without any credentials. The first IP is my IP for responder. The second is the IP for domain controller or the Windows server I want to exploit. It tries the, the API call. It, it tries the exploit and it doesn't really get anything back because it got pipe disconnected authentication error. If I go over to the other screen, nothing was received. Let's try it again, but this time with credentials. And this is a patched domain controller. So the patch is you aren't able to do this without authentication. But now what we have done is by successfully exploiting Petit Bottom, in this case with credentials, we have received the NTLM v2 hash or net NTLM v2 hash for the domain server machine account, machine account being with the dollar sign in here. There are some fun things you can do with this, the most common path. Hattrix has some really good uh, cheat sheet on this. You are going to take this hash, uh, you're going to run impact at NTLM relay X against Active Directory certificate services. And you can use this to get a certificate for the domain controller machine account. Here we're simply listening and we'll leave it at that. Okay, so we just received net NTLM hash for the domain controller machine account uh, by asking nicely, in this case, with credentials. This still works without credentials. Some of the other calls, some of the other exploits in the coercion real using the coercer tool may still work without needing authentication. Right. In, in those cases, what you're really looking at is there's a missing patch. Those It's a patch that prevented uh, the unauthenticated access to those specific RPC endpoints. And in this case, once we actually have that patch, you're good to go. But um, some of those weren't necessarily super high priority patches that were released. And it's, you know, the at the end of the day, these coercion attacks, they aren't necessarily that dangerous by themselves. It's if you have a couple other things misconfigured to use with it, like ADCS, all of a sudden everything falls over in your DA in about five minutes, which is amazing. So what you need to do to prevent, not prevent it, but mitigate it. See, I'm, I was a risk assessor, so I use the word mitigation. Um, you can mitigate it to reduce the risk. First of all, do you need Active Directory Certificate Services in the environment? Do you need ADCS? If you don't, get rid of it. Second, if you need it, require SSL on the web enrollment endpoint and enable EPA, which is the extended protection. This is going to prevent the signing in via net NTLM hashes. Um, even though we did capture the hash, we wouldn't be able to use ADCS with it. There are some other protocols. You could do some other cross protocol attacks with these hashes. There have been times, unfortunately, where machine account hashes have also been um, cracked because somebody set the password manually for whatever reason. Windows sets them by default up by itself. It sets a random one. Please leave it at that. If you need to know the password to the machine account, you're doing machine accounts wrong. Yeah. Right. LNK and SCF files. All right. So there is another class of attacks that is really, really cool. And that's causing users to send you an authentication attack. And so there's URL files, there's SCF files, which uh, we found out as doing testing before this, that apparently some of the latest versions of Windows 10 do not like SCF files and they will not give you a hash when you do them. Um, but then we have the LNK files, which are a Windows shortcut is what that really is. Uh, it's also known by some people as the let me know file. Um, what this does, well, this entire concept is part of a UNC path and the icon file. Because at the end of the day, Windows, when you look at a folder, it wants to identify what is the correct icon. And as you see over here on the left-hand side, an icon file was set to be on a share remotely. Well, if that share happens to be me as the attacker, 
and it happens to be where I have responder or NTLM relay X or some other sort of uh, attack going, that connection attempt is going to go to me. And then I'm going to either obtain a hash and use it later, or we're going to end up relaying. This is a really interesting thing because it happens by default and it happens uh, whenever a user views the specific element. So if it's put inside a home directory or inside a share, when the user scrolls past that, Windows will try to resolve that uh, icon file. So it can put a cool icon next to it. This can be used in a lot of different ways. And we've seen some weird situations where, uh, and especially in Citrix, I don't know why it was that there were some old Citrix deployments that we'd seen previously, where people had access to everybody's home directories, where you as any user could access everybody else's home directory. And so just consider for a moment the implications of dropping one of these files on like the home desktop or in my documents or downloads for all the users in an entire domain. You'd be getting hashes left, right, and sideways from everybody. And then you'd have the opportunity to send them for later use, like offline tracking. All right, let's go to the next slide here. All right, let me find my slides. Oh, <laughs> oh you moved it around. Okay, so this is an interesting thing as well. Now, I we already touched on the glorious and wonderful crack map exec tool. Um, a little bit. A little bit. We touched it. Byte Leader wrote this. He still has a group maintaining it, and you can subscribe to it, which that and some other stuff, which I'm going to advocate for. Support your local open source developers because they're awesome. And they've been giving us really cool tools for a long time. Um, also, super cool dude. Crack Map Exec has been just a wonderful, wonderful tool. And one of the modules in there was the Slinky tool. And this automated the idea of doing these LNK file attacks. So basically, it would find any location that you could write to as whatever user you were using on whatever servers, uh, whatever shares or systems you were attacking. And it would go in and it would drop an LNK file there that points and you can configure it where to point to. And so it would point back to you and basically automated this process of spamming out LNK files everywhere to be able to capture all the hashes. Um, it also has the ability to go and clean those up, which is very, very, very important. <clears throat> Write that down. Yep. Clean up after yourself and don't leave stuff all over a client's environment. It's very bad. Um, also, it makes people really sad when they end up finding um, the blue team keeps on finding these same uh, links and other things and weird hashes and weird behaviors after testing. So, Or the next pen tester finds stuff from the previous pen tester. <laughs> yes. Also bad. I love that. Um, so Slinky is a really cool tool, uh, uses the modules that's denoted by the big M there, Slinky modules, and then you're able to set a name for the files and for the servers. Incidentally, uh, the strangest thing that we've run into when we were doing this inside classes is that if you've got enough people spamming them in there, when our automated system would look at it, it wouldn't actually get down far enough in the list to resolve some of the uh, some of the icons, which was hilarious. But it's a great tool. Um, and this kind of goes back to an interesting thing, which we talk about in the class that we're going to be teaching, and it's important here, is thinking about these kinds of attacks as a class of attack. You know, we, we have this basic idea of relay, and we have this basic idea of getting the hash and cracking. Then we just start talking about different ways to get different hashes. And then as you start to get comfortable with this, we start mixing and matching and finding weird combinations that work together in different environments. I've been in environments where I 
couldn't get it, you know, it was like the super smallest environment. So I couldn't guess users. I couldn't get an account on this domain because it was teeny. But Petit Potom worked and Petit Potom got me a domain controller um, cache or a domain controller connection without ever authenticating against it. And I was able to use that to access shares. And then I, all of a sudden I was able to access shares that I'd never been able to access before because I was able to relay using one of these other techniques. And so understanding what it is that I'm looking for and what resources I have and then how to combine those resources is one of the great things about pen testing. Um, that also goes back to something that's really interesting about the class that we're going to be teaching. Part of the goal there is really that system admins and network admins are the first line of defense for a company. If we can help them better understand the how and the why of our attack paths, then when they are doing a configuration change, when they're making a choice, at the very least, it's going to give them one more opportunity to think about it. Was this a good idea? Is there a potential danger here? Maybe should we talk to somebody, talk to our consultants, talk to the blue team, talk to security before we do this to figure out how to do this in the long run. At the end of the day, Cosmo and I, our job is to make our own lives as hard as humanly possible when trying to break our clients. And so the harder that our life is, the better that we did, and the less we have to write the report because it's smaller in the future. And that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go ahead. And this is sort of an example of what that link file that Slink is dropping is going to look like. If you just simply cat it, you can see the actual IP address, the icon property being placed there. But we're going to demonstrate it. So first of all, let me pull up my terminal again. You make sure you're all seeing it. Excellent. I will leave Responder running. Um, let me actually close it, clear the screen, run it again. And we are going to utilize Crack Map Exec again, SMB. In this case, you know what? Let's just go after the whole environment, 2-7, going after the whole lab with the username of FileMaker and password of football. We want to enumerate every single share that exists in this environment. What we're trying to do here is identifying shares where we have right access, because once we find right access, we can drop this shortcut on that share. The only one we found is files share. Uh, we do have high privileges on C and others. We're going to ignore that for now for this box. We have write access on the file server box or files share. And that is where we're going to drop our slinky or LMK files. Let's change this to 5.3, our file server. And instead of using shares, we're going to use the module, specifying that with uppercase M. We're going to use slinky module. I will tell it I'm giving you options. First option being the name is, let's call it one, two, three. And the server in this case, let me get the IP for this box. 10, 100, 5, 6, 7. What Slink is going to do is it's going to find the writable share on that box. It is going to write the, create the LMK file and drop it on there. Okay. Let me show you what that looks like on the other end. So here's the share. I simply just browsed to it, did nothing else. I haven't double clicked it or anything, simply browsing to it. And what I should receive at this point, because Windows is trying to load that icon, the hash for FileMaker. Okay. I did not click on it. I simply browsed to that share. That's because the icon property was set to my Kali box, to my responder. And Windows tried to then load that icon. That is how powerful Slinky is. I can then also do, and this is where you put it on a 
share where a lot of people will go. You give it a name that will be sorted towards the top of the file share. If you want to clean up, you simply do clean up equals true. Yes, and it's going to find that uh, file and we'll delete it. Okay, so now that file no longer exists in that file share. Okay. So that's Linky. There's some really interesting other things you could do. Tracking pixels. Marketing people have been doing this for a long time, just differently. They have been putting tracking pixels in emails so they know when you have opened the email. Okay. Uh, that is because when you open up the email in Outlook, it's going to make an HTTP request to their server, which will let them know with, because of the GET request, you open the email. What if instead of HTTP, we had slash slash the UNC path for tracking pixel? We are going to get the net NTLM hashes this way. Okay. Let me pull up Outlook and I'm going to show you that because that is a fun one. And let me just log in real quick to this. I don't know. Uh, actually, I do know. I was going to say, I don't know how I got the email address, but as Jake mentioned yesterday, nobody uses Hotmail. So uh, what you need to do is first you create a new email in Outlook. Uh, let me close that. You don't have to do anything in this email. You just save it. And you're going to save this as an HTML. So funky message and it's HTML. I'll just save it on desktop. Okay. There you go. There's my funky message. Let's open this in Notepad. Let me zoom this a bit. Go towards the end. Anywhere in the body tag. I'm going to add, and no, we're not going to start the war over if HTML is programming language or scripting language or markup language. But you're simply going to do IMG source equals, and this will be your Kali box IP address. I believe it was dot six seven. Yes, it is. So ten one hundred five dot six seven. And just anything in the end doesn't really matter. We'll just do image.png, something like that. And I close it. Now, if I grab that message and I drop it in Outlook, actually not, not like this, I close, go back here. I drop it into the main Outlook window. It is going to open it as an Outlook message. You see that image is there. It's already trying to load it. I could have a proper image on the other end, so it doesn't look weird. It could be just a single pixel image. Let me just send this email over to myself, red teamers, whatever, funky message. Uh, maybe there is some weird message in here. Hello, how are you? Glad to talk. <laughs> just send it. So message is sent back to my responder. listening and as that email shows up it's trying to load that uh icon or you can just open the email to do the same thing uh what's really nice about outlook by default nowadays it is going to prevent download of pictures but if you have a good pretext something that people want to see you, you will tell it to download pictures. A lot of people find this annoying. So they do by default have it set up uh, by policy to download all the pictures. So as Outlook tries to download that picture, we get the hashes for that account. And Outlook seems to be trying a lot to try to pull that hash. That's a lot of uh, hashes we just received for the same account. Okay. Notice something in here though. Oh, I just posted the password. Great. Uh, <laughs> notice something in here though. The hash in here is different every time. Okay, the hash is has some different uh, deficient factors in here. That is because it's I think using timestamp and timestamp is going to be different every time. Okay, 
All right, good thing there was a burner account. So that's another way to get hashes. Third way, well, we're not third, fourth or fifth way at this point. Word. Word to the wise. I use Word. In Word, there are ActiveX controls. And this is Windows version of Word. I haven't seen it work well on Mac. You have the ability to add ActiveX controls. In this case, I could say, Word, add a Windows media player to a document. And the media player, in the properties, I point to something on my UNC path to my box, or my Kali Linux box. So simply enable the developer tab in uh, the ribbon options, then go to ActiveX controls, more controls. I use Windows Media Player, you could use something else, and then you can specify the URL. Thanks to Marcello for showing this because it's worked very well over the years since he showed it. Let's quickly demo that. Um, do some real quick demo of this. Same thing in here. We're going to open up Word. Let us have Chat GPT write uh, some kind of email to make it so we can actually make a good pretext. There we go. We got a good pretext in here. I asked, hey, give me one page document that invites employees to watch provided security awareness training video. Last time I used this, it was a daily status message to my client on the pen test. <laughs> and that was fun. So we've got this in here. How to participate. You can access security video through our internal training portal. Now you can access videos below. Okay. And let's add that video here. Now it's a terrible uh, Zoom with Word. It doesn't really do very well with ActiveX controls and all this. So refer back to the screenshots. Developer tools, right over here, legacy tools, pull up the ActiveX controls, grab Windows Media Player, edit, right-click, properties, and do 10, 105 .67, and something .mp4 is what I'm putting in the URL field. Hard to see in here, but refer back to the screenshots in the slide deck. Done, close, and I'm gonna save this document at, on my desktop as security training. Okay. Again, it's gotta be a good pretext. Word is not going to open it by default. It's not gonna try to open the video by default. So if the user attempts to click it, they're gonna see that. So let me run Responder again, listen to hashes. User tries to load the video. What we should get in this case, I probably mistyped the uh, IP address in there. We should get a hash. But this looks like I mistyped the IP. Anyway, so just imagine we got a hash. <laughs> we'll leave the demo there. This is an NNT, a net and TLM authentication will occur with this. Um, and you will receive a hash that you can use. Okay. So that is the obtaining of net and TLM hashes. When it comes to relaying them or using them, there's a few things you can do. You cannot pass net and TLM hashes, but you can relay them. So if I have obtained hashes few, by any means that we went through, I can use NTLM relay acts to obtain the hash and walk over to somebody else, another host that does not require SMB signing. And I can authenticate as you, as the user whose hash I obtained. Now, it can do quite a bit of things. It can dump ha uh, NT hashes, LM hashes if it obtains domain uh, local admin on the box, or it can create a session for you to utilize. So real quickly in there, let me pull up my, oh no, we, I did get a hash. It just took a bit. <laughs> so Word did try to pull the hashes. I just was not waiting long enough. Instead of using Responder, we are going to utilize Impacket NTL and Relay X. Okay. Thing with Impacket NTL and Relay X is we want to point it to boxes that don't require SMB signing. If we were to use crack map exec, SMB, specify our environment, 
and we want to generate relay gen dash relay dash list, I believe it is. And it's going to be to a file named relay.txt. What it's doing is it's looking for boxes that have signing set to false. So if I look at relay.txt now, there are two boxes in here 5.3, signing is false. 5.4, signing is false. So in packet NTLM relay X, why don't you go ahead and target boxes in that? Create a SOC session for me to send my traffic through and support SMB2. Right? Ah, it is SOX mode, my favorite. <laughs> so at this point, if I simply go over there, maybe I get a hash somehow, and uh, let's try to get the hash using Outlook again. Let's close the funky message. Let's pull that message up again. Hey, it tries to load that, load that uh, image again without asking if you, sh are you sure you want to load the images? Uh, didn't get the handshake, so let me try that again. Mm, okay. Let's do the coercion by simply, because you can do this too. If you have access to a box, you can simply try to go towards the responder. So let's do 10, 100, 5.67, something. And it's going to try to load that. Could not find what we were trying to load. And of course, just when I need to do the demo, uh, it breaks. <laughs> I got another idea real quick. I'm going to use Slinky. Yes, Slink is going to go drop it. And we're going to try to browse to that share. And here's our file. There we go. The file just existed. The user went to that share to pull that file. We got a connection from FileMaker from 5.3. We relayed it to 5.4 and we succeeded. Okay. We now have a relayed connection to 5.4 and we can do fun things with it. We already have SOX proxy set up. I will let you all try to figure out how to use it. But notice admin status. By coursing, by listening and pulling hashes for a user and just relaying them without even trying to crack, we have obtained local admin on a box. And the last slide in here is you could also crack the hashes. This is on one of our work laptops. I'm getting 30 mega hashes, well, 3,000 mega hashes per second. That's what, 3 billion guesses per second on cracking that hash. But if SMB signing is not required, you do not even need to crack the hashes. All right, that is it. Uh, we've been responding to some questions throughout, uh, and we'll stay here. Sir. Yeah, you got lots of questions, so we've been Sweet. capturing them through here. But it, it is one o'clock, so uh, we're we're starting to kind of almost post show banter is almost sort of becoming a thing. So with with that said, uh, if you have another meeting to get to, thank you for joining us. The seven hundred and ninety eight of you that are still with us, we got lots of thumbs up and claps and whatnot as people are ending. But if you liked this, please join us uh, tomorrow. We've got another webcast coming up, a Black Hills webcast on Thursdays. Uh, you can jump into the Black Hills Discord at discord.gg forward slash BHIS to find out more about that. Also, don't forget Wild West Hack and Fest registration is open. And if you liked what you saw here, you can get a whole lot more of it uh, in their training class coming up at Wild West Hack and Fest. So definitely check that out. Get your tickets soon and sign up for training. It's pretty cool. So thank you for joining us. We're going to stick around. Hopefully, can can you all stick around for a few more minutes? And we'll, yeah. we'll try and get Here through as many questions as we can. But holy Toledo, is there a lot? <laughs> cool. All right. You ready? You ready for Q&A? 
let's oh, yeah. do it let's, let's do, do it, it. yeah <laughs> so anyone who wants to come back on camera please go ahead and do it i know some of you already know the drill so let's go back to the top of these questions here so the first one i captured was from eric uh, guth i hope i'm saying that right is ntlm still used by microsoft's azure ad entra they will never get me to call it entra by the way uh infrastructure or is this only a traditional active directory technology it is truly an on-prem technology with a caveat uh not many organizations are purely azure ad or intra ad or Entra ad hopefully they don't go with x uh but uh majority of the organizations are using hybrid infra and you're still gonna have net and tlm there so unfortunately we are gonna be seeing net and tlm for a very long time to come Oh, yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I know a lot of organizations that are Azure AD, and then you find out, but but there's this one domain controller in the yeah. data center in Poughkeepsie because of this app that can only do on-prem AD. Uh, so totally. So Ursura Mutable also asks, uh, does the domain also solve the challenge the same way the user does and then compares the two? The only, the one the user creates and the one the DC creates. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, I'll yeah. take this one. So um, going back to the definitions of where we talk about NT hashes or NTLM hashes versus the net. Typically, we're talking when we say net NTLM, we're talking about the challenge response side, right? But the NT hash, which is actually a specific field, and we see it in the SAM, and we also see it in um, when we dump ntds.bit, which is where all your domain hashes are stored. There's no salting there. And what that causes is a password entered when used through that algorithm will always result in the same NT hash. And the domain controller already knows that NT hash. So you as a user either are using the NT hash that you have cached or you entered a password to generate it. And then a challenge is provided. So the user uses the challenge plus the NT hash, creates it. The domain controller is going to get the challenge field and they already know the correct NT hash because they're the domain controller. They are the source of truth. So they do the same forward calculation and then they compare the results and if they match, then they would confirm that it works. So forward calculations, it doesn't go backwards. Okay. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, we've also got, and, and this one might need to, you know, ask a clarifying question here, but Zoreb, uh, I hope I, again, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, what filter was that again? Now, this is when you were in Wireshark, you'd pulled hmm. up a filter. Uh, yeah, so that filter was, I'm gonna share my screen on this real okay. quick. MDNS or, and that is two straight lines, two uh, the pipes. Pipes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. LLMNR or NBNS. That's a display filter. Cool. Very good. Thank you. So hopefully you're watching there uh, and capture that. So Patrick Booth asks recommending to disable these uh, NetBIOS LLMNR. MNR, wow, that is really hard to go through. Right? Uh, you read it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And then MDNS is great, but isn't there the reality that orgs cannot because it will break functionality? Do you see this often? What would oh. be mitigations to add when an org cannot disable? But Patrick, I love that question. That is such a good question. All day. <laughs> it is yeah, a good you, question. Yeah. Do you mind if I start with that? Uh, you go for it, and then I will toss in my uh, <clears throat> color at the end because yeah. I'm kind of harsh about this one. Mm, so slightly. I'll go with a nice way, you know, since my title is director, so I have to consult a little bit. Uh, it is, there are ways where you could just not do anything about it, except for one thing, which is have a honey account, a honey pot sort of broadcast multicast name resolution request. And if somebody responds to that, because nobody else has a need to respond to it, you know there is an attacker in the environment. That is something you could do. Now, there are times when devices cannot get rid of, the environments cannot get rid of LLMNR, MDNS, and VNS for one reason or another. Um, my assessor background comes into play and I go, you need to first of all, document that as an exception. 
that needs to be an exception documented in your and you need to be have it in your risk register if you don't have a risk register you should start one you need to know what security recommendations what secure hardening techniques you need to do need to deploy but aren't able to for what other reason document that reason too is this is why we aren't able to do it today these are the specific hosts these are the specific environments where we aren't able to implement the secure hardening technique because of these very specific reasons that needs to be approved by somebody in the business not by an it person maybe not even by your it manager maybe by cto i would go beyond the cto or cio this is simply business saying we cannot get rid of this device we can, i come from healthcare background so my first response uh, recollection of that is a medical device robot that we can't get rid of because it will cost us 10 million dollars to get to replace it and we can't afford that uh, that is a true story the, and, the, the uh, robot wouldn't happen to be named after a famous renaissance painter would it it was yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm familiar with these devices yes so oh we, we should we should meet up at def gun have stickers yeah. for you oh you know uh, you got to come by the booth absolutely yeah. so you need to document as an exception you need to make it difficult to approve that exception every time you need to make it painful to approve that exception every time so it should be at least annually that exception needs to be reapproved and reassessed um that way you are slowly but surely pushing the organization into a right direction it, it cannot be a forever thing that we cannot disable these protocols uh, secondly, if you can segment those devices that do not support disablement of these protocols, that require the use of those protocols, that'd be a great thing to do. Segment them out. Still, there needs to be an exception documented, and it needs to be reapproved every year, every quarter, whatever um, you choose to do with that. Jake? Jake, what's the spicy? All right. So the spicy thing here. One, you're never going to get rid of all of them but that comes with an exception there are things like Chromecast that people have hooked up to tvs there are other devices like that and they will also send out broadcast name resolution protocols the question here or the real important thing to consider is does it matter in those cases no no it really doesn't um what matters is domain connected devices that's where the real risk is in most cases mm -hmm. um so having that level of understanding which that's the next level of understanding here is is it connected to the domain is it something that can actually be relayed that's that's an important thing to consider and then the we can't statement varies greatly between companies and so there's a lot of times where people we can't get rid of it because we have a printer if it is a printer that is sending out something or it we can't because these systems have to connect to this old old printer that we retain maybe it's time to recap some hardware and it, it's one of those things where the a lot of things that are going on today where people say we can't get rid of because of device i'm seeing a lot of those that are like man that that thing is past end of life and yes um I appreciate that meme. uh those things are past end of life and it's time to get rid of them. and so my hot take on that is that we should be looking at that more as a this should be a justification as to why we should be replacing this device mm -hmm. instead of a reason that we can't implement the thing uh, okay that's that's my that's my hot take on it oh yeah no absolutely I I love what both of you said and i do want to add one other detail and one comment we'll, we'll spend about nine more minutes taking q a because 20 minutes is, is kind of a long time to go over there and so we're not going to get to everybody's questions very much apologize but stick on hopefully we'll get to yours uh would the two of you gentlemen be able to go uh you know at the end end the real end uh to, into discord and chat with those who maybe didn't get their question answered yeah sure. yeah i awesome. can stick around i'm under sapper man i've been answering some as yeah Nelson was talking nice uh very good so um the the point i was going to make was 
uh, um, Kasim brought up, you know, hey, it needs to be a VP or whatever. My question was always, are you an officer of the company? And some people go, oh, I'm a, I'm a CISO. No, I, I don't care what your title is. Are you listed as an officer of the company? Can you make decisions on behalf of the company? And if they say yes, and they're listed in the filings for the either the corporate paperwork or the SEC filings, sure, yeah, you can sign off on the risk. Absolutely. No problem. Um, so Michael Barra, is it okay to set DNS resolution for WPAD to a loopback address? I, yes. there's a part, uh, yeah, there's a gut part of me that's like, you're a monster. Uh, but but yeah, so go ahead. Does it, I heard yes, but w- what does that end up doing for them? Um, when it reaches out to resolve, um, yeah. especially if you were to set it in Etsy host, which the whatever Windows System 32 drivers, Etsy hosts, or whatever that path is on Windows. Yeah, um, that's ultimately, that's the first place that it looks for resolution. So that kind of shortcuts everything else. And it would resolve it to itself. Now, could it theoretically break something? Yes. Um, do you trust anywhere that somebody else is spending spamming out a WPAD uh, thing? Probably not. I'd probably connect my cell phone if that didn't work. So, uh, again, hot take on that one. Yeah, my my background is from a lot of large organizations where I know that that would have just wrecked. <laughs> So, much stuff. so, so yeah. I'm dropping the registry location in the chat where you can go and disable WPAT. Uh, I still like the idea of setting one up that points to maybe loopback, or my preference is the domain name server or domain mm-hmm. controller. Mm-hmm. Generally less uh, destructive than the pullback address because there may be devices. I was when I was a healthcare assessor, I would go on sites and do some HIPAA high risk assessments. And I remember one of the hospitals, there was a doctor who was a, an avid gamer. Uh, it was a clinic actually. And that avid gamer doctor was also the IT person. Mm-hmm. And the way they set up devices was I just go to Best Buy, I grab the best desktop they've got, bring it in, plug it in. When that happens in your environment at some point, WPAD will show up again. So that's where I like the idea of WPAD being sent by crew policy or somehow to point to the domain controller in addition to it being disabled. Nice. Yeah, no, that well, we do have to talk at DEF CON. Uh, anonymous attendee, how does your account enumeration happen using the NTLM request? I, I think you covered that later. Um, I, I think what they're asking for is in the tool, how is it enumerating? the NTLM requests? Uh, I'm not sure to fully understand the question. Okay. Are, so if, we... if you're, I was going to say, if you're still listening, uh, Anonymous Cindy, I can't call you out, unfortunately. Jump into the Discord and maybe clarify and we can get you yeah. a better answer. Um, Admiral Akbar, which I said in the Discord, I love their name. Uh, have others had success with getting net NTLM hashes from MDNS poisoning. I regularly mm-hmm. get net NTLM hashes from poisoning NBT-NS uh, and LLMNR, but I can't remember the last time MDNS poisoning got me a hash. Yeah, yeah, you still get that. When you use especially CHTTP, that is MDNS in there um, because WPAD uh, queries often go on, M- on MDNS. Actually, most of the time it is MDNS with WPAD queries. So you do get net NTLM hash with poisoning MDNS. If you're not getting them, there's probably something else happening. Most of the time, what we see is somebody else responded to it before we did. Yeah. Because remember, there's that too. There's the oh, race yeah. condition. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'd like to go back one step on this too. Mm-hmm. Remember, that these are called broadcast name resolution protocols. The reason that they're called broadcast name resolution protocols is because of a OSI model layer two broadcast domain. So it stops at a router. Um, it It's within that subnet, within that VLAN that you're gonna see these broadcasts. So the concept of segmenting something to where those broadcasts may be going, but they're reaching a layer three boundary and it prevents it from going to the next subnet is very valid. This is one of those reasons that when I sat down and my drone sits, drone or laptop sits inside a uh, slash 16 for the workstations area, I just laugh 
and giggle because I'm going to get all the hashes. Mm-hmm. All the hashes because I get all the broadcasts. One thing I'm thinking about in there also, maybe making a bit of an assumption and a leap, but if you're seeing MDNS, it's likely Windows 10 or Windows 11. Mm-hmm. If it's Windows 10 or Windows 11, maybe there is some patching that happened. Um, if there is patching, you do see the MDNS request sometimes, but if the SMB signing, uh, I'm, I'm getting confused in here myself, uh, but if you're setting some of these configuration settings in there and you're requiring SMB signing um, and the host already knows about what it's looking for, there may be that it doesn't trust you. Um, let me let me get back to you on that because I, I do know that there are times when I wasn't able to get M- the poisoning to work even though I did respond to MDNS requests, and that was according to the client at that point, that host has had secure hardening done. And that secure hardening being SMB signing required, but I need to double check that. So I'll drop something about that in Discord. Wonderful. And I think you actually just uh, answered Gokus Gun's questions. Uh, do the DNS requests go to the DNS server router more than likely and broadcast multicast addresses even in Soho routers? And uh, I think you you kind of covered that. Yes, so, it yeah, was. Very good. It, it's the same everywhere. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, I'll give you two more questions here. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. One more thing I want to add. There is another group policy setting in your GPO around sending these requests over all of the interfaces. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. It, it gets bad. It gets worse. Yeah. Gotcha. So the, t- this one is because it's so specific, I want to ask it because I'm legitimately curious. So whoa, one, two, three, curious when capturing hashes through responder or NTLM relay, we start to see hashes with server challenge showing four, one, 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 four, and just kind of repeating there. Why do we see this? Does that sound familiar to you guys? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Jake, Jake you go ahead. Uh, I believe that's NTLM Relay X or it's um, Impact, it's SMB server. Uh, that challenge is statically set in some of those cases, and you can manually set it in a lot of those tools. Yeah. But the challenge portion, uh, 414141, hex, it's capital A. So that was where somebody was lazy and they put in capital A's instead of randomly generating a challenge. Um, That being said though, rainbow tables and other technologies can be used if a static challenge is set. So there was a site out there, I think for specifically for net NTLM V1 because it was DES, I used a version of the, the FPGA cracking system that EFF built but it could only work effectively if the challenge was a static challenge. And so with a static challenge, they could go through it and guarantee a crack within 24 hours, I think. Wow. So because Des sucks. And you are the server, right? So when you're responding to that NBNS LLM and MDNS request, you are the server. So you can set that. Mm-hmm. Last question here, because I think it's not a, well, it is a specific question was asked, but it, it, I'm looking through these, it kind of answers a lot of them. What are the mitigations that you would, the top, like, g- give me like the three bullets. If somebody walked in, they watched this demo and they said, what are the three things that I should go do right now uh, to stop you from doing this? First thing, first thing, require SMB signing. Don't just enable it, require it. So even if the hash is captured, I have to crack it. I cannot just use it as is. Okay. So if, if you cannot disable broadcast multicast protocols, at least require SMB signing. So hopefully you have good passwords along with that. Jake, what's your one? Um, then... So the most, so beyond preventing the relay, the most important step there is using really strong passwords. Um, Because even if SME signing is required across the entire network, if I can get you to connect to me, I control what my SME signing is. So I can sit there and receive that connection, or I can be the signed thing, doesn't matter. I still get that hash. And if I can use it for offline cracking, I've got a valid credit. 
And the third one in there would be for me, uh, and I'm going kind of off topic in here a bit, inventory. Oh, yeah. No what's in your environment. I mean, right here, but eat bottom, for example, you have ADCS, but for you, you don't even use it. Just just get rid of it. That's mm -hmm. that's a massive blow to anybody trying to exploit Petit Bottom. Right. So inventory your environment, get to know what's in there, because you're gonna need that when you start disabling any of these protocols. You need to know which of your devices require them or don't even have a way to do anything else. You know, what's funny here is I think probably what four or five years ago, this same list of basic stuff, the SMB signing, LLM and R, MBT and S. I distinctly remember seeing John Strand sitting there talking about it and going, hey, this is minimum. Do this before you get a pen test. Otherwise, it's going to be a bloodbath. Yeah. Um, it, awesome. It's been consistent for years in that. That those are the top things. That's I've had clients that asked, well, how did we do other than, and it's like, wait a second, there is no other than. This no, is table stakes. This is getting started. Right. Then we start to work on the other stuff. So. Awesome. So, gentlemen, thank you for your time. There was a ton more questions. I'm sorry, everyone. We couldn't get to all of them. We're already 23 minutes over. But for the 470 of you that stuck around, thank you for sticking around to listen to this. Uh, Kasim and Jay, just thank you so much, both of you um for going through this i know a lot of people learned a lot a lot of people there's a lot of like mind blown gifts and whatnot so uh if you want to hear more from Cosm and jake please sign up for the training at wild west hack and fest coming up here very very soon uh because uh if you thought this was mind blowing you're uh you won't have any cranium left at the end <laughs> Uh, we've got links in the chat and in Discord. Uh, please uh, go check that out. And if you like hearing us kind of ramble, we're going to be doing it again for Black for a Black Hills webcast tomorrow. Uh, you can join us uh, on our regular webcast time. So uh, these gentlemen here are going to hang out in the Discord for a little bit. So if your question didn't get answered, jump in there and ask it again, so they don't have to kind of dig through it. And uh, again, thank you for spending uh, like some of you almost two hours with us today, and it's, wow. it's really an honor and a privilege to do that so uh for the 420 for for the 420 of you all right for those of you still here thank you for joining us on another anti-siphon anti-cast for myself ian meyer ryan Cosm, jake megan brian and some of the folks who had to leave or ben uh the other brian and velda and everyone have a great day thanks for joining us ryan kill it with fire Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks.